Recording in progress. Welcome, Jed. Thanks for joining us. And with Thank that, you, guys. Uh, we can open up to questions for Jed. Jed, do you, uh, you have any managerial or uh, upper management announcements to make today or not, not ready yet? Um, if you're asking directly about David Ross, um, I mean, I think the, the reports you guys had were accurate. I think I've said, you know, a number of times, I think, I think David has done a fantastic you know, job as a manager. I think, you know, um, he's learned a ton on the job. Uh, even while learning, I think he's excelled. Um, I think he's, you know, kept morale good. I think he's, he's run the staff very well. Um, I love having him as a, a partner. So, um, you know, obviously, like, we've had some, you know, preliminary discussions on, on an extension. I think that was the report that was out there. That, that's accurate. Um, you know, so our hope certainly is, uh, is that David's here you know, for a long time. Uh, where do things stand with the coaching staff? Um, have you guys determined who is and is not coming back? Yeah, uh, we, you know we've had um, we've had discussions. I, I think that the um, uh, the ones I'm sort of prepared to announce. You know, obviously Anthony Iaposi. I think that's been public that um, that we've moved on. Um, Post is, uh, if anyone knows him, he's he's a fantastic human being. Um, as positive as anyone can be, you know, we brought him, brought him back to the organization after he was, he'd been the hitting coordinator when we had um, this core group coming up through the minor leagues. Obviously he did a great job developing those guys. Um, we brought him back here after he was in Texas. And, you know, I think at, at the end of this year, uh, I think both sides sort of realized that this is, um, you know, this was the right time to, to, to make that break, but nothing but, you know, really positive things to say about a, a great baseball man. And I think, you know, he came back here to to help got, kind of try to get us back to uh, where some of those guys had been. He, he worked incredibly hard and i um, super thankful for everything he did here. And then um, also on the coaching staff, uh, you know, Mike Borzell is not going to return. Um, you know, we have 10 years, um, 10, uh, you know, 10 really great seasons. He was one of uh, you know, Dale's first hires. Um, when he came in here, and uh, obviously a, a terrific hire, he's done so much for the organization uh, as a strategist, as a as a as a catching coach. Um, but I think both sides kind of felt like ten years was the right amount of time, and uh, I have no doubt he'll he'll land on his feet uh, and and do great things. But I couldn't be more thankful for for what he did here for for ten years. Jed, you've talked a lot about the decisions sort of being pushed back till after you find out what is the CBA is going to look like. So what is the process look like beginning now for you guys to prepare for when that CBA does become agreed upon? Yeah, that was a great question. And I think um, <clears throat> pro, pro scouting and, and, and all the – all the guys in the office, R and D, you know, analytics were obviously looking carefully at the um, both the free agent market and the trade market. I think it's our job to to get ahead of that to make sure we're as prepared as possible from a evaluation standpoint. You know, as prepared as possible. You know, from a strategic standpoint. Um, and you know, right now, it, you know, we will you know, spend this whole month. I wish we were playing, but we're we'll spending this whole month preparing, and then we'll be ready to to go when the off season starts and you know how it relates to the CBA. I think that's a real question. I think we, um, you know, that's a legitimate thing that everyone's going to be thinking through as they, as they start their off seasons, you know, the rules are going to change um, with how we do business. And I think that um, for everybody, uh, I, I think the question is, you know, how you move forward on, on certain things, given that, you know, the, the rules are going to change. So, um, that's going to be a, a factor. It's going to be a consideration for not just the Cubs, but you know, for all 30 teams as you, as you start the off season. In that same vein, uh, Jed, uh, a lot of teams are trying to be proactive and, and sign uh, some guys right away. Um, how, how is that balancing act for, for you and your people uh, knowing the, you know, strengths and weaknesses that you have and you'd like to start out. But as you said, 
you don't know ne necessarily what the rules are going to be and how uh, compensation will be impacted. Yeah. Um, you know, we've done most of our extension talks normally. We, we do those in the, the spring. Um, we, I don't think we've ever done, you know, kind of end of the season, uh, extensions, but, you know, certainly as I always say, like, I'm not going to announce who we're talking to, who we're not talking to, but, uh, you know, clearly there are players on the roster that we hope are here, you know, for a long time, probably past their, their years of control, but, um, I'm not going to sit here and talk about who we may or may not be extending just like I, I've kind of never done that, nor did, nor did Theo. So does um, what uh, Frank Schwindel did in the two terrific months that he had convince you guys that that is, um, you know, your that is your first choice and your first baseman going into spring training next year? Um, well, I'd say first of all, I, you know, that was a lot of fun to watch. I mean, watching him, watching the way he played, uh, just with the energy he had, the way he grinded his at bats. You know the ability to hit for power without without striking out much was uh, was really special, and I couldn't be more happy for him in his situation to to go out and improve it the way he did. Um, I think Frank is going to be a big part of our team next year. I'm not I'm not going to sort of make out lineups or you know anoint um, you know different guys at different positions, but you know certainly um, you know I'm excited to excited he's, he's on on our team uh, for next year, and I think he'll play a big role. Jed, along those lines, too, with uh, offense and just the way the whole lineup performed after the trade deadline, what did you guys learn or maybe take away from that that you can apply to this team moving forward? Um, I, it's a good question. I mean, I think that um, we gave we gave some guys opportunities um, that they, they might not have had, and I think that uh, it was a lot of fun to watch guys um, – you know, really, you know, seizing the opportunity uh, to perform in the big leagues every day. And um, obviously it was, you know, frustrating. Um, the losing the losing part of it was certainly frustrating. But on the offensive side, like the part that, you know, um, for me w that was gratifying every day was to, to watch the hustle, watch the excitement, watch the, the way they grinded their at-bats. Nothing was taken for granted. And, um, you know, I think that's something we can take going forward. You know, there was a hunger – to those guys that they're, they're they knew they their opportunity uh, they had an opportunity to play in the big leagues every single day in a in a big market and um a bunch of those guys grabbed that opportunity and, and really seized it and um there's a lot to be said for that kind of hunger um in players and um it, it was uh, it was nice to see for two months i know you've made no secret of the desire to improve the contact rate cutting down strikeouts uh I'm not trying to pile on Anthony, but do you take a kind of a wider lens at this? And will uh, Valeka be considered for that top hitting coach position? Um, yeah, Val did a great job for us, and uh, you know he's gonna he's gonna be back in uniform for us for sure. Um, you know, we're gonna do a search. Um, I think whenever you do a search process, you, you learn a lot. Um, you know, I, I don't want to comment on Val's status for that, but you know certainly he's gonna be a big part of our, our of our hitting infrastructure. And no, I mean listen, I think that. Um, you know, that's a hard thing to pin on a on a hitting coach, you know. Um, you know the the, the lineup and, and that that we construct in a lot of ways is, is more responsible for for things like contact rate, and um, there's no doubt we have to do a better job of that. Um, that said, I mean I think that um, you know the ability to hit the ball in the seats is really important. You know, it's um, sometimes a four hit inning is uh, is a lot more exciting, but the three run homer is actually what wins the game, and uh, so. We have to have a combination of those, of those things. I don't want to overemphasize contact at the expense of power, but um, to say that we need to be much a much more rounded offense, uh, well-rounded offense, I think is probably the fairest way to say it. Um, I think anyone that watched us for you know, the last three or four years knows that we got one-dimensional at times. Um, we did lack contact. We did sort of wait around for uh, homers, and we didn't have many many rallies. We didn't have many you know multi-hit innings and things like that. So. Um, you know, I, I think we have to be a well-rounded offense, you know, um, on base percentage is important. Slug is important, but also the ability to, to put the ball in play at the right times is important. And we can't, we can't really lose sight of any of those things. Hey, Jed, back to the guys that had second half success at the plate there. Is it fair or unfair, um, to look at it with a skeptical eye when it's, you know, 
playing for a lot less than it used to be. You know, obviously the, the standings didn't matter as much and or the other team isn't prepping the same way because these are all new players. And I even include Ian Happ in that conversation. Well, first of all, I wouldn't take anything away from the performance those guys had. I mean, they, they did it in the big leagues. And I, I think that's, you know, I do think that the, the, the teams were playing a lot of times were playing to, to make the postseason. So I do think they're prepping pretty hard. So I, I would never take anything away. I mean, I do think that, you know, you know, when you're coming up in this game, there's like truisms that you learn that uh, oftentimes are true. And, you know, people talk about, you know, being skeptical of spring performance, you know, being skeptical of September performance as you evaluate it. And, you know, there are reasons for that. You're playing against different rosters and, and, and sometimes, you know, less experienced players and things like that. So, I do think, yes, I think with any performance, I think you have to peel back the curtain, so to speak, and, and look at, at, at how that performance came about. You know, what are the underlying numbers, you know, of, of that performance? But I definitely don't want to take anything away from anyone because, again, those guys did it. Uh, the way they did it was impressive. And I think that um, they did it against teams that were competing to try to win, to try to, in, in a pennant race. And, um, there's no doubt they were preparing hard to, to play against us for that reason. Jed, did, you the any... were t- oh, go ahead. did you watch any of the American League wild card game last night? I did. I was having uh, 2015 Pittsburgh, you know, PNC Park flashbacks with uh, with Schwarbs. But yeah, I listen. I some people, you know, put down the uh, to put down baseball in October. I mean, to me, um, I can't say I'll watch every single game. Um, probably wouldn't be a very good dad if I did that but I'm gonna watch I watch as much as I can because this is why we do this and um as a fan playoff baseball is amazing you know um there was a moment last night in the game it was like a 2-2 pitch and the crowd like a uh, crowd erupted when it was a ball and I thought that's only in the playoffs that people scream for a, a 2-2 a 2-2 pitch and it's a ball so I think it's a different level of intensity um that's what you're preparing a team to be right that um when you watch the playoffs you realize that you have to have a team that can, that can you know uh handle only facing the best pitching can, that can handle uh, the intensity of those games and so uh to me you have to watch the postseason because that's what we're we're trying to do and that's the that's the level that we want to play at um and it's because you know i love baseball and those are the most fun games to watch so yeah i watched that game last night and um i'll be watching I'll be watching all fall. I mean, I know it's frustrating watching this offense at times over the last several years, but like, I guess how far away do you feel like the organization is from building another lineup that can compete at that level and make it to October? That's a good question. Uh, I've used this kind of story a few times, but um, I think it's hard to put timelines on things. Like I remember uh, sitting in St. Louis in the summer of 2013 and, looking at their lineup and looking at our lineup and feeling like we were like literally light, like light years away from being able to, to compete with them. And, um, two years later we beat them in the division series, you know, and, um, kind of kept going from there. And so, um, I think things can change quickly. I think that's the goal. I think when you think about, a, at least in the past, the national league lineup, but I guess, you know, it may be nine going forward, but it's been eight, you know, whenever I think about changing an offense, like obviously depth is really important, but, you sort of, you, you change it one piece at a time. Like when you, you know, we didn't get on base at all when we first got here and like we, we started to, to get on base when we started, you know, kind of changing one player after another and, and get and, and improving like one player after another. So, um, I think it can happen quickly, uh, as you, as you make those tweaks. Um, and I always, I'm sort of given comfort by what I witnessed last time, which is having that feeling of how are we going to catch up with this 20, you know, the 2013 Cardinals that had, you know, won a World Series in 11 and went to the World Series in 13. And um, it happened, you know, probably more quickly than we thought with um, by kind of stacking one good decision on top of another. To your point, Jed, the San Francisco Giants, does that come to mind as to how quickly something can turn around? Yeah, I mean, I think the Giants, this is, you know, this has been a process, you know, certainly, you know, I think that they obviously um, have had their struggles before this year. Uh, it's been a, a process to build it, but um, you'd be crazy not to look at what they've done this year um, and, and take notes. Um, 
they made some really shrewd acquisitions um, prior to this season. But um, in addition to that, they also got the most out of the players they had. And I think that that's like the, those, those two stories are sort of equal parts. If you look at the success of the, of the giants, you know, bring in, you know, I'll, I'll probably miss some guys, but obviously, you know, they, they, you know, they gave Gossman a qualifying offer. You know, they, they brought in Desclafani. They brought in Alex Wood you know, to bolster their, um, you know, their rotation, but also, you know, and, and they made some, some shrewd, you know, small deals offensively, like bringing in Wade, but at the same time, um, the unbelievable production they've gotten out of, you know, Crawford and Belt and, you know, Longoria and Posey, you know, these are guys that, you know, are, have had excellent careers, um, but they're having their best seasons in a long time. So I think that um, when I look at them, I think of both things. I think of both, both really shrewd acquisitions to get them there, um, but I also see uh, them maximizing uh, the talent they had in the roster and getting performances that they hadn't gotten in a number of years. So um, they're a lot of fun to watch. I think, you know, for me, of all the teams we played this year, I thought they were the, the most challenging um, because they didn't give up any at-bats. It was a grind from the first pitch to the last pitch and all seven games we played against them. And, um, I mean, it's a testament to their roster building and to the, you know, the way Gabe has, uh, has gotten those guys to play. You had a lot of moving parts on the starting rotation. You know, Advert to the pen, Steele, Keegan, you put them in, in the rotation. After seeing the way that, again, small sample size, but September unfolded, what pieces do you see need to be needing to be filled before start of 2022? Yeah. Well, I think that, the, you know, the guys you mentioned, you know, Advert, um, Steel Keegan. I mean, those guys are going to be a, a significant part of, of what we're doing going forward. Um, in exactly what role, at what times during the year, I don't know that, but certainly they're going to be a, a big part going forward. I mean, really, that we we need to dramatically improve our pitching. I don't think there's any any question about that. Um, our starting rotation simply wasn't good enough this year uh, to compete. Um, our bullpen was excellent for a long stretch, and I think we can't forget. I mean, we traded away. You know, Kimberl Chafin to Para at the deadline. I think you know prior to that, um, our rotation. You know, the first few innings of the game, the first four or five innings of the game, uh, was a struggle. But like when we were good, when we were in first place, you know, it was about the fact that we were really good getting the last you know nine to twelve outs of the game. And so um, I thought the coaching staff did a great job with those guys and and getting that that whole bullpen to throw well. Um, but if you sort of look at the whole season, there's no question that we have to, we have to acquire, um, you know, more pitching, better pitching this winter. I think that'll be you know, the number one priority because that, you know, said simply was the, was prop was the downfall of this season was that we, you know, our, our rotation was short um, and uh, we, we weren't effective enough um, in terms of run prevention. Hey, Jed, a follow up to that. Um, does that, with all your payroll flexibility you've got going forward, does that mean that we can expect that you'd be in on, say, the top two or three starting pitchers out there with the, with where you guys are at and your needs? Yeah, I'm not going to sort of uh, tip our hand as far as what we do um, in free agency. I think I've said repeatedly that, you know, we do have financial uh, flexibility. We have, we have money to spend this winter. Um, but I think it's really important that we do that, you know, do that in an intelligent way, um, you know, trying to win the off season. Um, I think we just talked about the giants, for example, um, they certainly didn't win the off season. Um, they won the season. Um, the Rays, you know, lost Snell and lost Morton. You know, they certainly didn't win the off season last year. Um, they won the season. And, you know, I think that when you look at some, there are teams out there that made huge splashes. They were, you know, aggressive. They were lauded for all the things they did and, and they're, they're not playing in October just like us. So um, as we build this, I think it's, in, it's really important to, you know, make one good decision after another. And um, I do think like that's, that's how I think about the off season. We're trying to trying to build a roster that can compete, but we're also uh, trying to do it without, um, you know, we, we're not, we're not looking to, to win the off season, which I think can be a, uh, you know, a, a real negative um both in terms of the season next year, but also in terms of the future, you know, using those two teams as an example, like the giants and, and, and the Rays, their future is also very bright because they didn't um, do those things in the off season. So um, that's something we have to keep in mind as we go through this. Wait, so that probably means 
staying away from say the bigger ticket top of the market guys and maybe going for more volume or or upside picks or or guys that you identify that that, that maybe is not on everybody's obvious radar screen I wouldn't say that. I think it's just being opportunistic and, and, and sort of striking when you feel like the, the, the value is right, you know? And I think, um, you know, again, I'm, I, I, when you talk about free agency, there's a bit of trepidation about, you know, what, what can be said and not said. But, yes, I think, like I said, we're, we're going to be active. Um, we have a lot of holes to fill in this roster. We have a lot of areas we need to improve. So I think we're certainly going to be active, but I think we need to be active in a way that, that we feel like we're getting the right value for the, the dollars we're spending and, that we're also making sure that we're not hindering our, hindering ourselves going forward um, with expenditures for right now. Uh, on the same subject, Jed, uh, you know, just advancing it a little bit uh, with power pitching the you know power arms is something that you would be looking at. Certainly, you have a couple of young guys uh, that you can turn to, but um, you know, the consensus was that um, you know a power arm and left-handed arm is something that was missing in your staff yeah i mean the way our our staff evolved um you know through trade and you know we didn't we didn't have you know we didn't have power stuff in our in our arsenal and i think i think kyle Hendricks, um obviously he's been you know so good for so long with his pitch mix but you know a lot of ways he's sort of a a a modern unicorn um you need power pitching you need power arms to, to win in today's game you know, you need to be able to miss bats. I don't think there's any, there's no question about that. And when I said earlier to, you know, to Taylor's question about, you know, our pitching fell short and a significant part of that is, you know, we didn't strike enough guys out. We didn't, you know, we did, we also walked too many guys, but we just didn't, um, we didn't miss enough, miss enough bats. We put too much pressure on our defense with that. And so, um, yeah, we definitely need to, um, to get more power arms. And that's something we're actively developing in the minors and i feel good about the progress there but um yeah i think that's something we'll be looking for in free agency as well um the makeup of our staff this year was too contact oriented so to speak and that's something that needs to change Chad, on the topic of pitching where do you view alec mills uh next year maybe long term with this team do you consider him in the starting rotation for next year yeah i mean i think i thought he did a great job down the stretch this year and um you know, I try to, in general, you asked about those other pitchers earlier. You know, I, I try to think about this in terms of um, ability to, to impact our staff, and certainly he's going to have a big part of that. I think that, um, you know, I, I think the, the modern game or the way that things are moving, this, you know, locking in, here are five starting pitchers, here are the eight relievers, and going forward, I think that's not the way the game is necessarily played sometimes. So I think Alec has a, a big role on our team next year. Um, I think he's best when he when he does start, and so I, I expect him to to like I said play a big role. But I'm just reluctant to sit here and tick off one rotation spot after another because I think as we saw this year, it's going to take a lot more than five guys to get through this. And um, you know, we use 69 players this year, so I think I'm, I'm expecting a lot of guys that are going to need to contribute. And all four of the pitchers we've mentioned so far, I think, are going to be a big part of our roster. Ted, on the, the young pitchers, um, we saw success out of Keegan and Justin out of the bullpen, and, and Justin mentioned at the end of the season how that helped them. Moving forward, is that a part of develop, development that you see could be possible, bringing young arms up through the bullpen first? Yeah, I'm, I've always been a big fan of that. I don't, I don't think you do it with every single guy, but in, you know, in my experience, um, getting that experience out of the bullpen can be really helpful. Now, you know, One thing I think it helps with is I think it helps guys realize, A, that they can – they can get outs in the big leagues, but it lets them, it, it pushes them to, 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 to push their stuff. And a lot of times guys realize when they go in multi-inning stints, they realize, wait, I, I'm in the third inning and I'm still throwing just as hard as I was in the first inning. Like I can probably go after it a little bit more. And I've seen that a number of times with, with guys that we've put in the bullpen and they realize that they can carry their stuff a lot longer than they probably thought. You know, sometimes as a starter, you have this sense of like working your way into a game and, you know, I've got to, I'm going to have to face the lineup the third time through so I can't show them all my tricks right away. I think that when you send a guy to the bullpen, they, they realize that just going after guys for, you know, for as long as you can can be really effective. And I've seen that with a bunch of guys. I think we saw that with Azale down the stretch, and I think we saw it with Steele. And hopefully that, you know, as they translate or trans, um, transfer into the rotation at some point, I think that, um, that aggressiveness, I think, can, can really help them. 
Yeah, just to follow up on Gordon's questions, um, when do you anticipate kind of baseball spending to return to say 2019 levels? I don't know ex exactly what that is, but um, right. I mean, how has two years of the pandemic impacted what you plan to do sure. going forward? Sure. Well, well, you know, we'll sit down and, and sort of talk through our exact budget. I mean, obviously, um, everyone operates within a budget, but I, you know, I expect to have, um, like I said, I expect to have, you know, resources to go out and uh, and to be active in free agency. Uh, you know, exactly what that budget is, it doesn't really help us to to talk about that uh, publicly for obvious strategic reasons. But I, I expect to, like I said, I expect to have the resources available to to be active. Jed, you, you've talked a lot about pitching, and, and uh, Rossi said, you know, if, if, to get back to winning ways, it's pitching and defense. I'm curious, do you view defense as a priority, trying to get it back to that, you know, 2020 gold glove level, or is that more of a finishing touch type thing uh, in your view? Yeah, I think it's all tied together. I, I think you know, it's ultimately run prevention, right? You can talk about pitching, but all that really matters is that you can prevent runs, and, you know, defense is, is a big part of that. Um, yeah, we we weren't as good this year defensively. Obviously, you trade a guy like like Javi, um, that that takes a, a, a bite out of out of the defense. Uh, Nico's injury certainly uh, injuries hurt us in that regard. I thought he was uh, embarking on like a really special defensive season uh, for us, and I think he's a, he's a, can be an impact defender. Um, so yeah, I think you're 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 looking at the wrong things if you're not focusing on defense as you think about pitching. They're kind of one and the same as you prevent runs. Um, certainly, I, I, like I said, I think we put too much pressure on our defense this year without missing enough bats. You know, the ball was in play a lot, um, you know, and that's that's a hard thing to, to overcome. So we, we need to miss more bats, which will help the defense, but uh, we we need to, to make sure we, we don't lose sight of defense as we build the roster because, I mean, Rossi's right. You know, the, you know pitching and defense are such, such, such um, stabilizers. You know, knowing, you know, going into each game, you've got a chance to win because you're, you're – pitchers are going to get you into the game and, and give you a chance and we just had too many games this year we didn't give ourselves a chance to win you know too many games were down early uh, that puts too much pressure on the offense guys press and um we like i said we took ourselves out of too many games early uh we need we need a pitching staff and a, a run prevention environment that we can kind of get into each game and, and be competitive every night and uh that'll give us a, a chance to compete and win if you're if you're down five five one six one in the third inning over and over, um, that's not giving yourself a chance to win, and that happened a lot this year. Jed, you guys had that revolving door at the backup catcher position a lot this year for a lot of different reasons, but things kind of stabilized when you brought in Chirinos. Yeah. Seeing how seamless that transition was for him, and uh, seeing how banged up Wilson was at the end, is bringing him back something that you guys would be considering? Yeah, he's a he's a great teammate. Um, I know the, the coaching staff thought the world of him, and um, I really thought like you know his presence meant a lot to us. Um, you know, I, I think with Wilson, I, I think um, I think he played too much, and I would just say that directly. I think that you know um, we did have that revolving door at, at backup catcher. It felt like we could never keep anyone healthy, and um, you know, I, I mean, Ross and I talked about throughout the year. It was hard to not play Wilson a lot but you definitely got worn down uh, I think he's an elite offensive player um, but it's hard to be an elite offensive player when your legs are gone you know and I think that he so I think that's something that we have to really focus on this offseason is, is building a roster and setting it up to, to make sure that you know we can keep Wilson as an elite offensive player because um, you play a guy too much and, and like I said you're eventually um, the nicks and dings of catching and just the fatigue of your legs and things like that are going to reduce your impact. So um, I think that's, that's really important. We knew, we knew given the catch, the backup catching struggles that that was happening as we went, but it was something that was sort of unavoidable in a lot of ways. And um, hopefully we can remedy that going into next year. Chad, um, Ortega solidified the leadoff spot for you guys, uh, you know, mostly against, right-handed pitching uh, how do you how do you see that role of leadoff man having evolved in baseball now uh, since you know Fowler was was your guy and um, you know all the you know looking at different guys over the last few years and figuring out how how that role impacts your offense I mean I'll be honest Bruce I'm, I'm pretty stubborn on this topic um, 
I'm old enough to remember us getting destroyed for leading off Kyle Schwarber. You know, what a horrible idea that was, and there's no way you can do that. That's terrible. And I, don't know, I watched him lead off last night, and I watched him lead off most of the season and have huge success. So um, I think that's a tough one, right? Like this guy was an elite leadoff hitter this year. He led off so many games of homers, and we couldn't – when we did it, it didn't work. And, um, and so I, I just – hit your best hitters the most often is – kind of how I look at lineup construction. I know, you know, with three batter minimum, I'm, I'm being a little bit flippant. I know you have to be strategic about how you, your, your left, right mix and things like that, but um, it's hard to go wrong hitting your best hitters most often. And that's ultimately what I think we should focus on. And, you know, um, I think that, you know, you know, putting a guy in a leadoff spot and having him struggle, I mean, it's happened to us a bunch of times, but I think some of that's randomness. And I don't think that's, you know, as the Schwarber example proves, it's not like he's somehow he has a, he's you know incapable of leading off, or he's pre you know so he is some reason he's he can't do it. It is it didn't work for us. It worked for someone else. Um, you know, I've I've been on good teams that let off Kevin Euclid, you know, and so like I said, guys that get on base, um, guys that give the pitcher trouble uh, right away. I, I think that's that that'd be my focus. Just hit your best hitters the most often. Speaking of the, the leadoff spot, I mean, coming into the season, Ian Happ was thought to be the guy that you guys could put there, you know, after he had such an extreme offensive season on, on both ends of the spectrum. I mean, how, how do you see his fit going forward, and how do you evaluate a season that has such drastic highs and lows? Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you look at last season, it was a little bit like that too. Um, yeah, you know, he had he was awesome early in the season, had, had a slump at the end. You know, this year obviously he struggled for a little bit longer, and it was you know it, it took him a while to get going. And when he did get going, he was an, a truly elite offensive player. Um, you know, I think I think Ian has every there's every reason to think he is that player. I think he can be an elite offensive player. I think he has to smooth out his performance a bit, and um, I think mean, that comes with maturity. You know, learning how to you know how to get through some slumps a little quicker. You know, I think that that's that's part of um, a player's maturation process is 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 dealing with some of those lows and whether that's a, a, a mental thing, whether that that's some mechanical cues that he can he can figure out. I think that's like I said, I think that's part of his maturity. But I have no reason to think he won't be able to do that. Um, yeah, I think he's perfectly capable of batting leadoff, no doubt. I think he's um, you know he's got great you know con- command of the strike zone. He makes really good decisions at the plate. Um, and so I, I see no reason why he can't, you know, get on base and, and be a catalyst for the offense. And uh, I'm just excited for him. You know, it was um, a season that was certainly uh, looking like it was going to be a potentially a lost season for him at, a, at an age where he shouldn't be having that kind of season. And for him to take off the way he did for two months, um, I think he goes into the off season with a ton of confidence. And you know, all the things I've said, he knows he's we've discussed that you know he needs to smooth those things out, but. Uh, what an unbelievable performance um, for those two months, and uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, you mentioned the bullpen earlier in early in the season, that formula uh, with the veteran guys at the bat. Do you think adding a couple more veteran guys to the mix will be important, or do you think you have seen enough from some of these young internal options that you kind of have maybe a formula in-house already for that bullpen? Yeah, I think the blend is really important. You know, I think that um, – well, first of all, it takes a ton of guys to, to, to form a bullpen. And so, you know, creating depth will be a huge part of, of what we have to have to do. But yeah, I think having some, a veteran presence down in that at bullpen is really important. I think that, um, you know, we, we've seen it with, you know, guys like Stropy with, with guys like, like Chafin, like Kimbrell, uh, where I think that leadership really matters. I think, you know, um, it's an unusual job. You're down there in this, in the bullpen, you're together. Um, you've got to go out there and get the most, oftentimes the most critical outs of the game. And I think uh, having that uh, veteran leadership down there means a lot. And I think, um, like I say, Dave Chafin and, and Kimbrell on this year's team, um, they took those guys under their wing and kind of taught them how to prepare, how to get ready, what to think about. And so um, I like the fact that we have power arms coming up through the system. I think that's going to really help. Um, but I also think like having that, you know, finding some guys that not only can pitch well, those guys pitch really well, but also guys that can provide that, that direction, I think is really important to have a good bullpen. How much catching up 
uh, do Braylon Marquez and Miguel Amaya have ahead of them? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the nature of the last two seasons, um, I think there are, there are different cases. I think Amaya, um, you know, last year was, was, was excellent. He got had some, uh, some part of a season before he got hurt. You know, Braylon obviously, you know, missed the full year. You know, right now he's healthy and throwing and ready to go, and we're trying to time – time his his pitching up with with this spring you know there's no point in ramping him up having him throw a ton right now shutting him back down and doing that again so we're trying to time that effectively he's healthy and ready to go but you know certainly you know there was um some some really you know bright spots from a young pitching standpoint but obviously you know i think braylon uh with his arm and his ability and not having him this year um you know certainly that was a disappointment and and hopefully he he's healthy and ready to go this spring and he can be a, a shot in the arm for us for sure as a reliever or a starter have you determined that or just well I think I mean unclear I think you know you know pitching weapon I think so to speak I would say but I would also say like to your question I think it's valid to ask how many innings he's going to have next year we're going to have to be careful you know coming off of a COVID season coming off of a, a season we didn't pitch I think those are constantly issues that we're having to to ask and address is that, you know, we, we're going to have innings limits on him where we have to figure out when to use that. Um, you know, not, not dissimilar to the way we had to use Albert this year, right. That we had to be aware of his health and aware of his innings. And I think our staff did a really good job with Albert of, of navigating those things. Jed, with those two guys, and then um, looking at someone like Nico Horner is winter ball, something that might be a possibility for all those guys to get some more at bats and more innings. Yeah, we've had conversations with all those guys about that. Uh, no final decisions yet. But, yeah, it's the balance of going to play winter ball, which is a, a great experience, a great life experience from a competitiveness standpoint and, and, and getting more at-bats versus um, just working out, getting a chance to, to get your body in, in great shape going forward. Um, winter ball probably does delay some of that a little bit. So um, some of those discussions are ongoing, and we don't have any decisions right now. But it's a good question because we have had those discussions with those guys. It was a few years ago, I think, at the GM meetings or something, where you said you can't really you know, do the bullpenning thing throughout a full season. Maybe not uh, one through five in the rotation, but I'm curious with guys like Alzali, Thompson, Steele, maybe even Marquez, is there a way you can fill a couple rotation spots with guys that go three, four innings? I think you can. Yeah, I think you can. I think, yes, to, I don't think you can do that with the whole staff, um, but I think that um, – you know, certainly, we've we've seen teams do it a creative job of you know piecing some rotation spots together with guys going to your point three and four innings at a time, and sometimes that can actually give your bullpen more of a break than than the than than starting, you know. And so, um, you know, the the most important thing is 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 like how do you get twenty seven outs in a game? And I think that the way that's that's happening in baseball is evolving, and I think that's that's in a lot of ways a good thing, you know. And um, you know, you're not going to get 21 outs um, and then turn it over over to the eighth inning guy and the closer that often. I feel like when that does happen now, it feels like a night off, you know, and um, it doesn't happen as much as it used to. So with that in mind, if you have some power arms that are that are better to get nine to 12 outs, then you can you, you have to you have you have to use your roster effectively. I mean, I think no, like Tampa is, is a perfect example. They've done such a good job of. Um, they've got some starting pitchers, but they've got some guys that they, they think are good for a certain number of outs or a certain number of times through the lineup, and they do a really good job of uh, of getting 27 outs. And, and and it's not always with you know getting the first 18 to 21 out of a starter. And, uh, back to Nico, and you just mentioned, you know, obviously he didn't get to finish the season the way he wanted to health-wise, but what have conversations been like with him and what's the emphasis for him this offseason, both in terms of, of you know getting healthy and – managing that through a full season, but also just, you know, positionally not necessarily knowing what position he's going to play next year. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think on the first, the first point, um, I mean, he's frustrated as you'd expect. I think most of the conversations with him are about that frustration. Uh, he had such high hopes for the season, given the physical condition he came in with. And, you know, he's, you know, multiple different injuries, some random, you know, and some, and some soft tissue. And, um, We've obviously talked about how to address those things with his, you know, high performance work, with his, you know, strength and conditioning, and making sure he's um, he's ready to go and addressing those issues in the off season. 
Um, so yeah, it was a frustrating season in a lot of ways, but I also think um, he was able to prove to himself that I think he knows the impact he can have on the big leagues when you know he impacts the ball at, at this level. I mean, he's a really he's a really impactful player. Um, he knows he may move around next year. He knows he may not, and I think I would just say that he he embraces that. Um, he knows his versatility uh, is really valuable. He knows that the the modern game you know, really does embrace what he does well, and so um, he may be in a situation where he, he's playing at one spot every day. He may be in a situation where he moves around, um, but that moving around, you know, as Javi has shown, as Chris has shown, that doesn't um, that doesn't detract from your value. In some ways, it actually adds to it, and so he he embraces all of that and knows that. Now we may not know exactly what his role is, you know, going forward, but we we know he'll be he'll be a significant part of our team, and he'll be in the lineup almost every day. Did he, um, for lack of a, a a longer way to explain it, get uh, too thick, too muscle bound? Do you think um, for the baseball athlete that he is and what he represents um, at multiple positions? I mean, it's a question we've asked and, you know, we'll continue to ask. I mean, trying to figure out what his what his best physique is, what his best weight is and strength is to, to play a full season and play a full season, as you said, moving around. So, yeah, it's a valid question and one we're, we'll, we'll talk about. I do think, you know, he's a different player when he's impacting the ball the way he, the way he was. So uh, I think the added strength it definitely helped his game, but we have to make sure he can stay on the field. And, you know, that's one of the hardest – challenges when you're sort of when you're um deconstructing injuries and things like that is like you know what you know where do the strength you know gains lead you know lead to a hamstring injury where do they lead to his his oblique injury and yeah I, I, you know it's not like you have perfect answers but it's certainly a that's a your question is valid and one that we've definitely talked about and we'll continue to to to, to monitor with him to make sure that he's like prepared to play a, a full major league season following up on bruce's question i i know it was a really goofy year in terms of guys coming back after the short season. Um, there were a lot of injuries. But there were also a lot of guys that uh, had had their rehab stunted because of recurring pain and all that. Yeah. Is that something you, you, you're going to look at, or is it just, just yeah. chalk it up to just a, a unique routine, one that's been – was disrupted because of COVID and having guys come back to play a full season? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I mean, first of all, of course, we're going to look into it and try to figure out um, are there things we can avoid or the things we didn't do, did do. Um, we wouldn't be doing our job um, if we didn't really evaluate that. We actually have a medical meeting this afternoon and those issues will, will definitely come up. Um, that said, I do think it was a, it's a weird year. You're dealing with uh, guys playing a full season after playing, you know, 60 games or, or fewer the year before. And um, there were there's more injuries in baseball this year. I hope that's a blip in the radar, and I hope we get past that and get back to a little bit, you know, more sense of normal when it comes to injuries, especially soft tissue injuries or kind of overuse injuries. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to listen. We'll do a you know full you know, full evaluation of all of that, all of those things, and we have to get better. You know, um, you know, you can't you can't use the the COVID season or the increased workload as a crutch. We had a lot of a lot of missed time with players, and we have to you know make sure that we can avoid that as much as possible. Jed, uh, what kind of role do you see for uh, Justin Hayward or Jason Hayward coming up the next two years? And is there a benefit to having him around when Brennan Davis uh, finally comes up having a mentor? Yeah, I mean, I think Jason not you know not dissimilar to Nico in some ways. This is a year where he couldn't really get it going. Um, and just was constantly nicked and dinged and having having injuries and it was a really frustrating season for him in, in in a lot of ways and you know unfortunately that was coming off you know his best season with us he was fantastic in, in 2020 and, and showed us what he can do when he's on the field and healthy and, and hitting so you know I know I know he's got a, a big plans for the off season you know from both an offensive side and a you know physical conditioning side and you know um, I, I think Jason is. Uh, you know, throughout the struggles of the second half, he stayed positive. He was he was a leader down there. I know that's he he always wants the, you know what's best for the Cubs, and he's a, he's a terrific teammate. So um, his his year was frustrating for him, and and uh, I know he'll do everything everything he can this winter to to try to address that. 
Jed, with uh, someone like Patrick Wisdom, where the strikeout rate just doesn't look sustainable, but he brings you that obvious power as a strength. Kind of as he goes into his off season, sort of what's the the message to him in terms of hey, we want you to get better at the strikeout rate, but we don't want it at the expense of of losing what he brought to you guys in that power. Yeah, it's a hard thing when you start trying to like deconstruct a player, right? That you know, yes, I mean the strikeout rate's high, and obviously you'd wish it was lower, but I mean the impact is real. You know, I mean his uh, his power is real. It was unbelievably fun you know watching him play this year and i'd also would add that you know he's a really valuable defender um he's really good at third he can he can move around the the diamond you know there's a lot of lot of value that he provides and you know i think that it's important like as you think about players like you you have to focus on what they do well you know i think what he does well he does exceptionally well um you want to chip away at those weaknesses and see if you can improve them but you you don't want to do those things at the expense of the things he does at, at a pretty elite level. And uh, he does a lot of things that way. Hey, Jed, we didn't get a chance to talk to you um, at the end of the season as uh, as you guys went through that, um, what appeared to be a, a COVID outbreak. But given what you've gone through really all season with being one of the lesser vaccinated teams and what some of the teams have gone through with outbreaks and stuff, going forward into next year where this thing doesn't seem to be going away, how, how big is that going to have to be part of your planning for putting your roster together next year? It's a great question. Um, I, I guess I, I hope, uh, I hope that that's something that's addressed. You know, I mean, I, I would, I'd love nothing more than um, to walk into a fully vaccinated clubhouse every day and to get rid of the, to get rid of um, those concerns. I mean, obviously, I don't think COVID's going away. Um, I think you can still get it when you're vaccinated. Um, I'm a living, breathing example of that, you know. So it's not like we're um, we're not going to eliminate it. But um, that was a horrible feeling at the end of the season. There's no question. And um, you know, given our vaccination rates, I think we were unbelievably fortunate uh, throughout the year. You know that. Um, you know, that what happened at the end of the season was the first time that's happened to us in, in two years. And um, I think, you know, we were really careful in 2020. I think that, you know, candidly, I think it might have been might have been really fortunate this year to avoid to avoid outbreaks. You know, we had a couple of coaches, you know, get it. Uh, I got it. Rossi got it. But, um, you know, ultimately with players that we were very fortunate uh, to avoid it. Um it's a terrible feeling and it's something I hope we can eliminate not, not just as the Cubs. I think, you know, ultimately with the Cubs, I hope we can, we can do that. But as an industry, I hope we can get to a place where, you know, who's on the COVID list or, you know, who's vaccinated and unvaccinated. It'd be awesome if that was not a, a topic of discussion um, and that we could just, you know, move forward and, and, and not, not have those concerns about, about vaccination rates or masks or things like that. It'd be nice to, uh, to get to a place where um, the whole sport is vaccinated. What has your um, experience been like these last 11 months? I mean, we know you're an experienced uh, baseball man and, you know, ran the Padres and had tremendous experience with the Red Sox. But for your first time as uh, the, the top baseball official with the Cubs, what was that experience like for you? Um, it's definitely an interesting year, uh, to say the least, you know, um, I think in terms of, uh, the performance of our team, it was disappointing. I don't think there's any other word that you can, that you can use. I mean, you go into a season, um, especially with the talent that we had, you go into the season, you know, hoping to, to be playing, you know, this week and we're not. And I think that, um, you know, we've changed the expectations of what it's, what Cubs baseball is supposed to be. That's one of the proudest things you know for me with the Cubs is that we have done that you know when we got here um you know making the playoffs you know at random times was was acceptable and now I feel like it's not acceptable and and there's real disappointment when we have a season like this as there as there should be so I think from a team performance standpoint obviously like I said it has to be disappointing because we're not we're not playing right now um you know personally um you know, I'm glad I have a really good staff around me, I guess is what I would say. You know, um, I'm working through the, the GM search right now, and I'm excited to, to, to sort of add a partner and you know, bring someone in that can, that can help me. But I couldn't be more you know, proud of the, the guys with our staff. You know, um, for us to, 
to get through, I think, really successfully um, a trade deadline, you know, given that we thought we were going to be buyers up until, you know, probably three weeks before the deadline that we were able to kind of, you know, transition, pivot and be able to um, make trades, I think, are going to be really impactful for the, the future of the franchise. I and mean, I was really proud of um, the way our office uh, handled that. Um, they were able to, to pick up a lot of slack this year. Um and uh, and you know with uh, you know Theo being gone without um, sort of having a GM in place, so um, like I said, that that's probably what I would say. Um, disappointed in the in the performance on the on the field as I have to be. I, I, we have to we have to be better. We've we've raised those expectations, and you know from a personal standpoint, just grateful that you know to Rossi and the, the coaching staff for um, what they went through this year, uh, and you know using sixty nine players um, trading, you know nine players in July. Um, and, you know, I said, grateful to my staff that I have. They're, you know, been here for a long time. They, you know, all they care about is that getting the Cubs, uh, you know, back on top. And I think that we, uh, we were able to handle a lot of work. And I think in, in, in those behind the scenes ways, I think we were really effective. Do you have anything else for Jed? Yeah. Uh, Jed, switching gears a bit, just Rowan Wick and the you know, interesting injury he had, uh, just troublesome injury all year. How important was it for the team to get him back and, and see what he can do in the back end and some high leverage moments in the bullpen this season? Yeah, I think it was important for both parties. I mean, I think that that was one of the more confusing, you know, confounding injuries I've, I've seen where, you know, we test after test trying to figure out exactly what was what was the, the matter. And um, to his credit, he stuck with it. He grinded through and, and, and got back and uh, he had a lot of outings where he looked like an, an elite reliever like he was before he got hurt. And uh, I think for him, getting back was really important. He goes into the, the offseason healthy. I know he's going to you know, really keep working. We, we talked the other day about uh, you know, tweaking some of his pitches. So um, he's back and he's uh, you know, back talking about you know, pitch shapes and, and how to get hitters out and not talking about this kind of odd rib oblique injury that, that, that bothered him for so long. So I think that was, that was really important. Hey, just, is, there, is there a plan for uh, Brennan Davis next year? I, I didn't hear the question. Do you have a plan in mind for Brennan Davis next year? Um, well, I think, I think in a lot of ways, Brennan, um, you know, he's kind of shot past our expectations for this year. Right. So we probably have to readjust them going forward. Um, you know, he's a, a high school High school kid who's a great athlete that you know probably didn't play quite as much baseball as um, some of his peers uh, because he played a lot of basketball and you know last year the alt site was kind of a, a frustrating season and so you know we started him out um, in South Bend to sort of kind of work him up slowly uh, given that and um, he kind of blew past what we expected so um, probably um, reluctant to put. Um, to hold him to certain expectations because, like I said, he outperformed these. But I would just say, you know, what a what a special year he had. You know, being at three levels, performing exceptionally well at, at each one. Uh, I'm really proud of him. He sort of kind of burst on the national stage um, with his futures game performance and kind of never looked back. And um, he's a really exciting part of our future. Hey, Jed, just one quickie backing up. Uh, the rest of your coaching staff, can we assume they're all coming back other than the – the two guys you mentioned. Uh, yeah, I, I would. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know there will. Uh, you know, we're, we're having still having conversations with a number of, of people, but um, yeah, I think that you know the the bulk of the staff will certainly be back. And and like I said, I think that our staff did a really terrific job this year, grinding through a really difficult year where you know, thanks to trades, thanks to COVID, thanks to injuries, etc. We use more players than anyone's used in in uh, the history of this game. And, um, and I think that they deserve a lot of credit for, for sticking with that and being positive. And I think, you know, getting the most out of a lot of guys. We have anything else for Jed? All right. Thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.